Welcome to Adventures in Coffee, a podcast by Caffeine Magazine, sponsored by Oli and Ifinka. In this six-episode series, Scott and I are exploring the world of coffee for people who are curious about what's in their daily cup. Because I think we're all becoming much more interested where our food and drink comes from. Um, we decided to make this podcast to demystify some of those things and really still try and keep it fun. So we're going to take you on a journey around the world. We'll speak to experts and answer the questions you've always wanted to ask about your cup of coffee. My name's Scott. I am the founder of Caffeine Magazine. And you know what? I'm a bit of a coffee nerd. (laughs) And I'm Jules Walker, a very proud East Londoner, a cycling advocate and cycling maven and your everyday coffee lover. Now, in this episode, we're going to talk about really, I mean, like really expensive coffee. Actually, Scott, how much have you spent? What's like? What's the most you've spent on a, a, a coffee before? I'll be honest with you, I don't really buy coffee. I get most of it sent to me. Oh, but get you! <laughs> I think the most I've ever spent is like twenty-five pounds for a bag of coffee. But we're talking more than this, aren't we? We're talking like three times that. We're talking like seventy-five pounds for a hundred grams. And, you know, it's a lot of money and we need to ask the question, is it actually worth it or is this all just a massive marketing scam? I mean, the idea for this episode started, Jules, when I believe you gave me a call. Uh, Why don't you take us back to that question? Well, I came to you, Scott, because you're the king of caffeine and I knew that you would be able to help me out on this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I was on the hunt for an anniversary present for my partner, Ian. So, you know, we've been together for, for quite some time and he loves coffee. I love coffee. Win-win situation. I thought to myself, let's just get some, you know, top end coffee. Mm-hmm. So I'd found two the two coffees, which was the Geisha and the Kopi Luwak. But I was looking at paying £75 for either one of them. Ow. Mm. That's a mm. lot of money, Jules. It's a lot of money, but it's a lot of love, Scott. Do you think that's why I've been divorced three times? <laughs> I haven't really been divorced at all. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> all right, then, Scott. How about you quickly explain what Geisha coffee is and what Kopi Luwak coffee is? OK, so now you might have heard of Civet or Kopi Luwak, as it's also known. It's been in films like The Bucket List. Yeah. It's the, it's the kind of coffee that always comes up on those BuzzFeed things. Like, Six best coffees in the world. They are. <laughs> and they're always rubbish. No, that's my opinion. Anyway. <laughs> um, it's effectively where these lovely little furry weasel cats chomp on some coffee berries and then poop it out and someone comes along scoops it up and sells it to you mm. so yeah it's coffee that's come out of a cat's bum <laughs> um but the other one that we're going to talk about is geisha coffee now if you're from my part of the industry mm. geisha coffee is this you know it's this coffee that is revered i mean this is like getting smashed in the face with a bouquet of flowers <laughs> while simultaneously stuffing your face with a mango salad. Yes. <laughs> it's quite the image, Scott. It's quite the experience. Okay, Jules, look, let's leave Kopi Loak to one side for the moment because I've got a lot to say on that, but let's just focus on the geisha. Mm-hmm. And yes, geisha does cost them a lot of money. I mean, recently, a pound of geisha fetched over $1,000 at auction. So I, so I understand that this stuff can be super expensive. But I also don't think it costs that much more than your Mm. average coffee to produce. And I argued that marketing hype does actually serve a purpose. You know, there are people out there who want to pay good money for special things for a special occasion. It is a special thing. Yeah. But you can get other special flavours. If you want that bouquet of flowers, then go for an amazing Ethiopian. You don't have to spend £75 for a tiny bag. Right. And this is what this conversation took us on, this whole journey, because we both ended up agreeing that if we are going to be convinced by anyone that Geisha Coffee is actually worth that money, the person that we need to talk to is going to be Rachel Peterson. Mm. So she's the co-owner of La Esmeralda, which is the coffee farm that brought Geisha to the world stage 20 years ago. But... Before we get into all of this, let's just have a couple of quick words from our sponsors. Scott. Yeah. Have you heard of the term farm gate price before? It's the price that a farmer is paid as the coffee leaves his gate. I mean, it's literally the cash that's in his hand as they take those bags of coffee away. So why does it matter if we don't know what the farmer gets paid? Well, I suppose the worst case scenario is that the producer just gets totally stiffed. 
Hmm. It could be a situation where they get paid less than the cost of producing that coffee. That feels kind of crappy. Because we've paid top dollar for our really nice cappuccino and it turns out the middlemen have taken all the money. I mean, this is the wonderful thing about I think of technology. It verifies what that farmer got paid mm -hmm. and you can see all of this data. So if you want truly transparent coffee, ask your roaster to get their coffee I think are verified. Hello, this is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. It's Jules calling from the Caffeine Podcast. Oh, hi, Jules. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Hi, Scott. Hey, Rachel. It's lovely to hear from you. Great to hear from you, too. <laughs> so, Rachel, as I explained in my email, I found myself in a bit of an anniversary dilemma. I rang Scott and it then turned into a conversation about is very, very expensive coffee actually worth it? And I'm of the thought that it is. Scott's thinking not so much. Thank, thanks for throwing me under the bus there, <laughs> Rose Jules. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you see, I just I set that up immediately, so I'm already in the winning corner. This, Rachel, this is... Yeah. You're, you're already the nice guy, and I'm already the bad... <laughs> you're already good cop, and I'm already bad cop. I love this already. <laughs> I was wondering if you maybe could tell us a bit about what Geisha Coffee actually is. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Geisha coffee is a variety that originally came out of Ethiopia in the 1930s. It went through Kenya, went through Tanzania, through some uh, varietal gardens there and arrived in Costa Rica in the 50s. It was planted throughout Panama in the late 60s, early 70s. But it turned out that it was a very low producing variety. So most of these farmers cut out this new variety and they didn't continue with it. And we purchased a farm in the late 90s that was an abandoned coffee farm. And on the bottom of that coffee farm were a variety of different trees. So back in the 70s, people didn't taste coffee here in Panama. They might have somewhere in the United States or in Europe. But here in Panama, we produced coffee. We looked at it. We made sure it didn't smell uh, like vinegar or rotten or anything like that. And that was it. And so my brother had just gotten back from college. He has that same coffee again, and he presents it to Rick Reinhardt, who was here in Panama. Rick Reinhardt, for people who don't know, is, used to be the executive director of the Specialty Coffee Association. And my brother gave him this coffee and he said, yeah, definitely put that coffee into the best of Panama, which is a competition that we have here in Panama to choose the best coffees every year. So in 2004, my brother put it into the best of Panama and it was loved overwhelmingly by all of the judges and by everybody. And it was quickly accepted here in Panama as a wonderful variety. When you smell it, mm. After it's roasted and ground, you're going to find just this wonderful, very strong smell of jasmine. But you're also going to find peaches or stone, any type of stone fruit. So the identifying words are going to depend on what part of the world you live in. So in Asia, they always say lychee. It has a lot of lychee in it. All in all, it's a very fragrant, sweet, when it's done well, very structured, but complex. Mm. It has to have layers to it. I feel like I can taste this coffee already just having <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> so you were saying how this geisha blew everyone away when they tasted it at this auction. What happened afterwards? We were hoping for $6 a pound, which we thought was a great price in that time. Because at that time, the coffee price was actually not even a dollar, maybe. Mm. And the auction started and the prices just jumped immediately to $10 a pound, which back in 2004 was a huge amount of money, by the way. And so the guy in charge of the auction, he said, I've got a hacker, we've got to stop this. So he stopped the auction, called up the people and the people were like, no, 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 <laughs> we really want to do this. And the coffee went up to $21 a pound that year. And it was the record breaking year. I mean, we've had other records like $600 a pound, which don't compare even at all, to that first year of $21 a pound, where roasters all over the world were horrified. It was unbelievable. That was, nobody could believe it. And after that, it was easy. There was a buzz all over the world. Everybody was talking about it. So it sort of had a life of its own. It just took off. So anyway, when you were asking there, Jules, about <laughs> Geisha coffee, for mm. me, is it worth it? I drink Geisha coffee every day. And I definitely think Geisha is worth it. But if you're going to spend money and you're worried about the money you're going to spend, mm. there's two things that I would say. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. One, make sure that that geisha is coming from somewhere that you know it's coming from and that's a reputable source. And two, really, really make sure that that roaster knows what they're doing. Yeah. Because a badly roasted geisha is just not even as good as any other coffee. You, you burn it a little bit and it's done. It's delicate and it needs to be treated with a lot of love. One of the things I was really interested in that you were saying, as you were describing this coffee, it sounded more like a perfume. Hmm. These are just flavours which, for a lot of people, don't exist in coffee. So this is never going to be for anybody who's going to ever add anything to the coffee. If you're going to add anything hmm. to it at all, just buy anything except for geisha. So no milk and sugar then? Terrible. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Could I also ask, obviously, you've got a lot of people that work for you on your farm. Have any of them tasted it? Well, for one thing, I have a small team of people who are going to cup with me because I need them to have an idea of what this tastes like. But I can tell you one thing, they don't Mm. like it. (laughs) It's not for everybody. That's a fact. If you, especially or somebody like who just likes that really strong, bitter smell, but like the really strong, I should say, roasty smell of coffee. I'm not really sure how to describe it. It's not going to be for you if that's what you're looking for. Mm. Rachel, can I ask, previously in our discussion, we talked about how the coffee has a rarity value and it has a number of reasons which kind of push the, the price up. But can you talk to me about, does it cost a lot more to produce? I mean, is it costing you a thousand times more to produce than it would to like a Bourbon or a Katura or some, some other kind of coffee varietal? Um, not a thousand times to produce. At the very least, double to produce it, though. However, for example, here in Panama, our cost of production are much higher than in any of the neighboring countries. So I sell our most accessible coffee. We sell that for three fifty a pound. It costs us more than that to produce it. I just wanted to, to touch upon why it's important to have very high priced coffee on the market because I don't know if it changes the expectations of what we should be paying for our coffee. Listen, I'm going to tell you that I think it's important because those high prices on coffee make it so that people are willing to pay a reasonable price on coffee for other Mm. coffees, which didn't used to happen before the geisha. We want to raise the quality of life of coffee farmers across the board, or at least that's Mm. what we say as an industry, especially for the small coffee farmers. But there is this resistance to pay more than a dollar ninety to these small farmers who have a decent coffee, but that's not going to cut. That's that that, they're not they're not going to get a good living like that. We know they're not going to. It makes it so that a roaster coming here and saying, I mean, I'll pay you $3 a pound is no longer absurd. When I started 15 years ago, I had to fight between 140 and 142 oh. a pound. <laughs> I mean, and we were losing money back then. Mm. We were in the red. So things have changed. Mm. And it's not only because we're Esmeralda. Mm. To me, and excuse the the pun here, but it filters down to the rest of the the coffee industry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's the perfect, perfect pun. You went there, didn't you, Jules? It's true, because <laughs> it feels like a sort of win-win conversation to have something like that available on the market. So here's an interesting thought experiment. What's the ceiling on Geisha Coffee at auction? What, what, what do you think the highest we'll ever get to? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's kind of crazy. The whole thing is kind of crazy. How much will Jules have to pay for your coffee in 10 (laughs) years' time? (laughs) You know, I don't know. I hear, I've heard rumors here and there about $10,000 here and $10,000 there. Wow. I... (laughs) I, I, I don't know what to say about that because really, we, we all really know that those are just marketing gimmicks. I mean, it's not like the a 10 grams of any coffee are going to be worth $1,000. It's, it's, it's marketing. Mm. We can agree on that, right? I mean, I feel bad saying it myself. The coffee is great, but I guess marketing, it, it's the same thing probably with these very expensive wines. It's the scarcity. It's the uniqueness again. Mm. It's having not a lot of it that makes it have these prices that are not necessarily a reflection of what you're getting. But I now have to ask, because of the fact that that Scott put that coffee bean of an idea in my brain about the price of it. You went there again, <laughs> Jules, didn't you? I'm full of these. How many times have I told you, don't do the, you don't do the gags, I do the gags. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking to myself, maybe, maybe it has to be a, a, a damn special anniversary as the, the years go on. But should I be buying 
this coffee now before it gets too expensive? Or do I need to actually just increase my income by tenfold to be able to afford it? in the future just buy lots of it and put it in the freezer <laughs> i don't want to do it just no is that is that even Definitely the right thing do to do that. exactly exactly <laughs> i don't I, think I, that it's going to be they're all going to be thousand dollars a pound i mean i think you're going to be able to easily find something for i don't know forty dollars a pound towards the future mm-hmm. i think you're safe i think you're safe <laughs> So take care, guys, then, and I guess I'll sign off now, and we'll talk later at some point. Awesome. Take care, Rachel. Lovely. Thanks again right. for your time, Rachel. Bye-bye. Bye. I mean, I don't know how you felt, Jules, after having that conversation with Rachel, but I was really impressed with just how candid she was. There was no filter to, to what she was talking about. Mm. She wasn't trying to ram 75 pounds a bag coffee down my throat and telling me that's the thing that I should go for. And mm. she was honest enough to just say the taste of it isn't for, for everybody as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also think that was interesting is that she was mentioning the fact that, like you say, this isn't for everyone. Mm. And that there are great coffees which can be also bought for much, much less. Mm. And in some ways she was even like selling you the idea of paying much less. I appreciated that. I really did. And, you know, it it then pretty much led to me ditching the idea of spending £75. However, our investigation into which coffee, you know, is is worth it wasn't quite over yet because I was still toying with the idea of the Civic Cat coffee as well. Oh, Jules. <laughs> when will you listen to me? <laughs> this is why now, we are here, my friend. I know, I, know, I know we're sold this idea that these cats are walking around, you know, they're picking up coffee cherries off, off of the floor, they're eating them and pooping out uh, these coffee beans. They just happen to be found by some unsuspecting farmer who picks them up and processes them. But the reality of this, well... The reality that I was aware of was very much that these cats were being captured. They were being put in cages. They were being force fed these beans. And, you know, these were then being kind of sold on to you know, unsuspecting tourists as sort of like, hey, this is a local thing. It's a local delicacy. It's like really wild coffee. And it's just not. It's just, you know, it's a trade. But on the flip side of that, I I found websites that told me that there are civic cats out there that are roaming free. So they're they're not in cage, they're not captured, they're not being force fed the beans. That you know they're essentially free range cats. Yeah, they they exist. I mean, I mean, good point because I mean, I didn't actually know. I mean, I I am aware of speciality coffee people in the UK mm-hmm. who have you know a very high presence as it were who also say that they have ethically sourced civic cat coffee right so i didn't know i mean i have biased opinions and i thought the best thing for us to do really was to you know arrange that call with Janice Girardi from the Bali Animal Welfare Association and ask her you know what what's the real story with these cats Okay, but before we get on to that, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. Okay, here's something interesting. Right. Richard Uster founded Oatly in Sweden in 1994 based on his research on lactose intolerance at Lund University. What else do you know that comes from Sweden? Meatballs. Probably not the best. (laughs) Probably inappropriate. (laughs) Saabs. Sturdy, trusty, reliable. Cars also kills the planet. Anything else that doesn't kill the planet that is actually coming from Sweden. Ulrika Johnson. <laughs> Obviously, ABBA. Yes. Spotify is from Sweden. Of course, where you can listen to Adventures in Coffee. Man, that's slick. <laughs> o A T L Y exclamation mark Oatly. Uh, hello, this is Janice from Bawa. How can I help you? Oh, hello, Janice. Uh, my name's Scott Bentley. I'm calling from Caffeine. I've also got my good friend Jules on the line as well. 
Hi, Jules. Hi, Scott. Yeah, so we had some questions、uh, regarding some like, expensive coffees. And one of the expensive coffees that we hear so much about here is, this,、uh, is Kopi Luwak. And I understand that you've got、uh, quite a, an in depth knowledge of this subject.、Um, sure. I first came to Bali in 1973, and I've been involved in animal welfare issues in Bali for decades. And Kofi Luwak is one of the issues that we investigate because of the cruelty to the animals. So maybe I'll hand over to you, Jules. Maybe you can talk about how, what you're looking for here. Yes, I'm looking to get some, some very nice and sort of once in a lifetime coffee for mine and my partner Ian's anniversary. What I found out or what I saw was that it's foraged wild so that the animals aren't treated. Cruelly, you know, it's a completely natural process. The, the rarity of it is the thing that makes it so exclusive and so special and therefore so expensive. I'm still of the hope that there is a way that this can be done <laughs> ethically. Like, there, 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 there must be somebody out there that's doing it ethically, surely. Well, interesting. If you want a little bit of history, going back to Dutch a hundred years ago, perhaps, the origin of Kopi Luwak. Was that the farmers who work for the Dutch were not allowed to take the coffee beans from the trees? So, civet cats or Indonesian called luaks, their natural behavior, they're nocturnal animals. So, they hide and sleep in the daytime in trees. They come out in the nighttime. They're very shy animals. And civet cats would find the coffee cherries that drop naturally from the trees. They are very selective. They choose the best quality ones in the wild again. And then they eat the coffee cherries. It stays in their digestive system for 24 hours. And then partially undigested beans are defecated by the civet cats. Farmers, they discovered wild luwak beans that had been defecated and they were collecting it and they started grinding it. And there's like this special fermentation process inside the cats that is believed to be a richer taste. And that was kind of the origin of luwak coffee. So it definitely came from the wild and can come from the wild, but it takes so many. It takes so much. So, what they do is once the civet cat defecates these partially digested beans out, they have to collect it and then they clean it. And then they're able to get just a little bit of it that they grind into coffee. So, if you can find it in the wild, imagine how much you would have to forage on river valleys and under trees to find enough of these cherries and you know, partially digested cherries in order to even make your 100 grams of coffee. It takes really a lot. Now, I'm Bali Animal Welfare Association, so we're talking about Bali. And we've investigated quite a few of the so called wild luwak plantations. There is only one that we have found that. They do not cage their animals. They allow them to roam free, but they're still within a large chained off area. Land is quite expensive in Bali. I mean, I guess it's your definition of wild and natural because honestly, the kivet cats are still confined. So any confined animals is really, for the most part, against animal welfare principles. The other thing that's really interesting is I don't even know how you would assure that it was pure because we talked to a neighbor down the street who had a Kopi Luwak cafe and he said that he and most of all of the other cafes he knows import the coffee and they import it from Sumatra or from Java. They know that it's only 20% genuine Luwak and the rest of it is mixed with Often quite bad local coffee. So, to ensure that you would be buying genuine, pure Luwak coffee and that was not cruel to the animal, honestly, maybe you'd have to come to Bali on your honeymoon and I could take you out to River Valleys and we could go searching. <laughs> <laughs> It might come out cheaper than the, than the 100 grams of coffee. <laughs> 
I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I feel for you and I understand it would be something really interesting and unique to have, mm. but that animals that we have seen here mm. in Bali are still confined. And these animals are kept in very small cages for life. They're let out only if the cage absolutely needs to be cleaned. We get calls all the time that, you know, tourists call and say, we saw we were at this visiting this Luwak plantation and three of the animals are really, really sick and their skin is peeling off and you have to come and do something. So we'll go, of course, and we'll negotiate with the owners and we'll usually be given the animals. We'll get them into vet clinics and get them treated, negotiating that we can release them in the wild. But, you know, what, the next day or next week, they're just captured again back into captivity. Janice, what, in your opinion, do you think is fueling this? Do you kind of trace it back to a specific time from a specific place? Yeah, I would say Bali would be the heart of it. And it was driven by tourism. Right. And for the most part, that's within the last two decades. And when I first came to Bali in 1973, I'm old. <laughs> there was no Kapi Luwak. You'd never heard of Kapi Luwak. Mm. And so it only takes one person to invent the, a novelty and be able to market it well. And then the next person copies it and the next person copies it. North of where I live, there's 50, 60, 70 Luat cafes. Honestly, the only good thing about COVID this year is that all the most of the Luat, you know, the tourism has closed down. And so most of them are now closed. Mm. I suppose the fact that there's uh, been a, a Hollywood film probably not helped the situation either. Yeah, this is what I was going to say as well, because I got completely sucked in buy it because even the, the scenes in the <laughs> film were, were beautiful like the, the beautiful golden siphon you know it just kind of proves that marketing is a very strong and potent drug absolutely Jules and also I think that it's marketed as the most expensive coffee in the world perhaps or one of the most expensive coffees and people always want that you know the glamour the story to take home I was in Bali and I had a cup of the most expensive coffee in the world and it's rare etc cetera, etc cetera, that it is all hype and it's so sad because these animals are truly suffering Janice, I'm sure I probably know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. Have you actually tasted pure Kopi Loak yourself? No, nor would I, because, yeah. <laughs> because that would be really breaking an animal welfare principle. But I live in the heart of Ubud, and I meet many, many tourists who have tried it mm. with very varying reports on what it tastes like in their experience. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that perhaps we can do like over here in the UK that can help the civic cats and put an end to the cruelty that they suffer to produce this coffee? Most people don't realize how cruel it is. So I think awareness and having a conscience and a heart and being willing to do the right thing and educate as many people as you can. Janice, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. It's It's been an education, Janice. And, you know, I'm now completely reevaluating my coffee choices that I, I yeah, was... Yeah, I'm thinking champagne or, <laughs> you know, truffles. Yeah. <laughs> Some kind of truffles sauce on something but that's not, rare. Not the Kopi Luwak. Not the Kopi Luwak. <laughs> but thank you very, very much for interviewing me on the subject and for talking to us. And I'm sure it will help. And we just really appreciate it. Oh, it was an absolute pleasure, Janice. Yeah, thank you for your thank time. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, Jules. So you got a present to buy and you got £75 burning a hole in your pocket. What did you decide to buy? Neither one of them is what <laughs> I went for. After all that, after that emotional roller coaster with, with the coffee, I, I did still go for, for a geisha though so mm. still kind of on brand and where did you get that from it was from a roaster called kiss the hippo i really like the name of it mm. and it was actually one of rachel's coffees uh panama hacienda la esmeralda and it was only 30 pounds for 150 grams of it as well so it's still kind of pricey but not as pricey as 75 quid now they're a really good roaster actually um so you, you chose well um and you know after that conversation with with rachel where we were talking about the the notes and the flavors and everything it it genuinely was like spraying a very expensive bottle of perfume in in the room it was just absolutely stellar and ian's reaction to it was just Mwah. 
He loved it. Absolutely loved okay, it. Okay, Jules, hang on. <laughs> yep, I'm no maths genius, but I work out that's 45 quid left. What did you do with the rest of it? <laughs> oh, it's it's super predictable, but I ended up buying cycling stuff for Ian. Obvs. But, you know, there's still part of me that was quite curious as to what the Kopi Luwak coffee tasted like. But, you know, after everything that I learned about it, it's it's a no-no in regards to trying it. Yeah, and I don't think you're missing out on an awful lot, to be frank. I've spoken to many people within the coffee industry who, over the years, have had stories about tasting this. And essentially, they're always very underwhelmed. Um I think there are many, many amazing specialty coffees at very, very reasonable prices, which would outgun this coffee on every occasion. I just, you know, I just don't think you're missing out on anything here. So it's, it's true. You don't have to experience everything in life. Let's run the credits, Jules. OK. This podcast was produced by James Harper, the creator of the coffee podcast Filter Stories. And he also writes and performs the piano music. Now, if you want more information on what we've discussed today, we've put links to Hacienda La Esmeralda and the Bali Animal Welfare Association in the show notes. And if you like the show, please subscribe on your podcast app. And you can also help others find the show by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or CastBox. You can also follow us on social media as well. So you can find Caffeine Magazine on Instagram at Caffeine Mag, Jules, myself at Lady Velo, and James Harper, our wonderful producer at Filter Stories Podcast. And tell us on social media, what is the most expensive coffee you've ever bought? And, you know, if there's anything else you'd like us to look into or investigate. Now, in our next episode, we'll be exploring the environmental impact of your coffee. Yeah, correct. There's like 250 grams of like carbon floating around in the atmosphere from when you drink a coffee. Like it's just, it's, it's incredible, in fact. We're asking, what's better for the environment, an oat latte in a disposable cup or a regular latte in a reusable cup? And you may be surprised. For every 100 calories that you put into an animal, you only get about 17 useful calories out. You can find more episodes of the show wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening and we'll speak to you next time.